rubbish. I ran a series of concerts at the Bullet, not concerts, of gigs at the Bullet Gate that I called a Hootenanny. And the idea was that people could come and get up on stage with the band. And I had a really good rhythm section. Really, go and look on um, my YouTube channel, look for the Halloween bluegrass version of Thriller. <laughs> Lots of really great musicians who came along, but also anybody from the audience who wanted to come and shake a tambourine was very welcome. And if you wanted to sing a song, let me know a couple of weeks before. I'll chart it, let the band know. If you're terrible, we'll manage you gently off stage, <laughs> but delicately, and not in an embarrassing and shameful way. But if you're good, great, let's do another one. And they were really, really good fun and worked really well. And people started to understand that you don't have to be an expert to engage in communal music making. And I think one of the possible futures for pop music, and we need another word for it really, one of the possible futures for pop music is in what I think of as embedded music. Music that takes place within the context of a wider artistic activity. So instead of me getting up on stage and singing my songs one after another, here's another song about a great friend of mine who sadly died in Europe. <laughs> I get up on stage and I sing my songs, but they're woven together in a kind of event, and maybe I have a couple of actors who have some kind of stuff going on that weaves it all together, or you work with uh, were you waving to say hello? <laughs> no, we would say something, but... Yeah. Okay, or you work with an artist in an installation, or you work with a filmmaker, or you do something where it's, the music is embedded in something else. Yeah. Exactly, this is what I'm doing right now. We'll so, I did an something. experiment uh, at the Barbican um, <coughs> two weeks ago, where basically I created a play, a 50-minute play, and I was the protagonist and I was the person that was narrating. So there was a narrative for 50 minutes, and people, and there was another performer that was part of it. So there were two actors, myself and the performer. And people, they realized that, as I started like narrating, they realized that they were part of the performance. Because I was showing at the direction, or the performer was just grabbing them, you know, to be part of this. And then I composed the song with them. I was the living piano, who started moving and they started say which note this is, you know, and then they play the rhythm. Great. And then they voted, and then some people started discussing with me, so they became part of the narrative. And music was the soundtrack, because every, every three, four minutes, I started singing a song that had to do something with the story. Right. So I took the story, and I made music part of the context. And people loved it. It was around 20 people. Yeah. About 15 of them engaged. Yeah. Some of them were like this. And if you can engage people, I used to do a thing where I'd get the first line of a song on some technical event that happened that week, and I'd have that written on a clipboard, and I'd hand it out and say, go ahead, add, add a line, and in the break, me and the band will look at it and figure it out, and we'll perform it. A great fun thing to do. I want to move on, if we can, to another business model, but it kind of segues seamlessly. I have to think carefully before I said that, but I got it right. It segues seamlessly into another business model which you know about very well. This is, I don't know quite what to call it, it's the under the radar model or the Jane Sibbery model. Does anyone know Jane Sibbery? Yeah. Canadian lady, had a bit of a thing going in the 80s as a folk artist and disappeared. It's intriguing that none of you in the room, apart from one, two, possibly three people know who Jane Sibbery is. She probably earns more than most of you, even those of you who are clearly prosperous. There's <laughs> not many of you, but I understand. Jane Sibbery, I met at Rose's birthday. Jane Sibbery does house concerts. This takes music away from the big drama of the, the stadium and the arena and the, the, the sturm and drang of all the stuff that surrounds it and puts it back where it came from, which is in the home. And if you think about it, before the invention of wireless recording, there are only two ways in which you could get to hear music. You either made it yourself or 
you had someone coming into your home and make it all, okay, three ways, or, or you went to see them perform, right? What Jane Sibbery does is really clever. She decides what country or what hemisphere she wants to be in in what time of the year. So November, December, January, February, do you want to be in Europe? No. Where do you want to be? South America, South Africa, Australasia, right? So she emails out all her contacts and says, I'm going to be in Australia in December. Do the sums with me. Anyone that can get 30 people in their front room for $30 a head, what have we got? $900. And I know I'll sell 10 CDs at $10 a head, what have we got? I'll make that a grand, right? right. <coughs> I'll come and play in your front room. Okay? Right. Brilliant. <laughs> I looked on her website after talking to her, after your gig, I looked on her website, you know how many gigs a month she had? Fifteen? Fifteen grand a month? And you've never heard of her. She said there was some, sometimes she'd go into a house and she couldn't wait to get out. She'd pay her own flights and she'd pay her own hotels, right? So, okay, even if she pushes the boat out, she's going to spend two or three grand a month on that stuff. Sometimes she knew as soon as she was finished she'd be out of there. Sometimes she'd be with people that she thoroughly enjoyed being with and she'd stay and have a great time. But she works her way around the world doing this stuff. She said to me, when I was signed, that magic word again, I used to play at the Barbican and the Festival Hall and I'd come out with $100 because I'd paid the band, I'd paid the promoter, I'd paid my manager, I'd paid the merchandising guys, the crew, and I'd come out with $100 and go, what's the point? Why am I doing this? She said, now, I do what I want. I make my own records in whatever way I want to. I've got the budgets. I can afford to do what I want to do. There's another artist who I have a terrible habit of messing with people's names and I nearly called her Loretta McPewitt to her face once. She's Lorena McKennett. Anyone know her? Yeah. Yes. Canadian artist. Beautiful. Does lovely acoustic guitar and harp things to the beautiful setting of the Lady of Shalott. Beautiful. I met her. She was supporting a band that I was playing with on a tour in Europe and got talking to her and found out her story. Ah, oh, she was also signed to Warners at the same time as me. It's really interesting how she got the deal. She started off as a busker in Canada, in Toronto, I think she's from. And she made enough money busking down by the waterfront to record and manufacture 100, C uh, 100 cassettes. Remember them? Yeah. <laughs> and sold them all and went and made 500 and sold them all and went and made a thousand and sold them all and went and made a first CD and sold them all and started gigging and built up her business. Nobody knew about her, that she was never in Music Week, she was never in the music press, she was never on the TV, she was never on the radio, she just went out and worked, a travelling minstrel. I met her. When I was signed to Warners, in fact, I supported her band on a tour. I remember now, I supported her band on a tour. She was signed to Warners, but what she had done was really funny. She got fed up with doing her own admin. She had about 20 CDs on sale. The merchandising table at the back of the hall was groaning under the weight. And she got fed up with all the office work. So she invited the major labels to tender. Yeah, great. She said, which one of you would like to sign me then? Best offer gets me. <laughs> fabulous, fabulous turning on its head. Yeah. So she'd done that even though she was signed? No, she wasn't signed. She'd done it all herself. But she got fed up with doing the office work. So she contacted the major labels and said, would anybody like to um, do my act, please? When did she do that? 20 years ago? 20 90s. Years ago? Okay. So, but now I'm just saying, this is what the major labels are doing now. They're offering their services, so, so she was really ahead of her time. She was way ahead of her time. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. So, that's the Jane Sibbery model. House concerts are a growing phenomenon. 
if anybody would like me to come and do one, I'd be most delighted. <laughs> they're great fun to do because there's they're kind of there's a sort of purity to it, yeah. Genre, schmonre. <laughs> I think mo what's really interesting is that most artists nowadays have an acoustic version of their set. Do you know the little rabbit bomb in Colchester? Do you know the Kelvin Institute? They run these house concerts, they're fabulous places. The Little Rabbit Barn, a fabulous place to play, a beautiful place to play. Where is it? Near Colchester. Um, that's a kind of pure back to reality, if you like, in my opinion. It's thoroughly enjoyable. I kind of have a bit of a bias here because I've been lucky enough to play in football stadiums. If I hadn't, I would still hanker after that. But actually, as a musician, it's easier to play in football stadiums because the audience know you, they know all your songs, they like you, otherwise they wouldn't just pay 70 quid to get in. Most of them are fairly drunk by the time you go on. You have the technical support that is second to none Somebody hands me a guitar on exactly the right tuning at exactly the right time and takes the eye on for me and puts a beer by my amplifier when the other one's gone. But playing to a room full of people you've never met before, that's scary. It's hard. But it's a wonderful thing to do. It's a fabulous thing to do. So that's, um, that's we're kind of running out of time here. I've been yakking. I did promise you the opportunity to offer some input. And I've, not really given you much, have I? Um, let's have a quick look, see if there's anything else we want to talk about. There, there's a new business model that I'm not quite sure where it falls. I think it's one of the holes in the sinking ship model. It's the subscription model. The idea that you don't buy, you don't own your music, you rent it. Who's got a Spotify premium account? Who bought one of the Nokia phones with music deals? Right. <laughs> Why have Apple left it so late to launch a, uh, a streaming service? Apple are normally way ahead of the market. Because I think Apple invested so much in the iStore, which sells music, that they could not change their mentality sufficiently to get the subscription model together. Do we think the subscription model is a good idea? Let me float past you a few kind of wrinkles in it, a few of the ways that people are doing it that's not at Spotify level. I'm an artist. If you subscribe to me, you will get everything I record throughout this year. Everything. Good plan? Yeah, if you like my favourite artist, then. Okay, that's an interesting idea. Yep. Yeah. What about an unknown artist? But you've got to service those customers. You've got to keep them interested, keep them doing stuff. Here's an interesting thing that I found out. I've been writing a blog. For a year. I stopped back in April because I've done a year solid every day with the exception of a couple of days I wrote a blog. You can find it, he said, shamelessly self-promoting, mm. on my website. You see, you've got to do this. Um, and what I found very interesting, www.jstapley.co.uk We'll find you. Well, I've scrolled it down too far. Technology, we don't. What I found really interesting is that having floundered about in a pool of madness for so long, trying to understand how to make Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all this other stuff interact properly, 
reverb nation, all that stuff. The problem with those things, the reverb nation, the band camp, the tune calls, we've all got them, right? We're all on one of them, aren't we? Yes. Yeah. Right. How many of the friends that you acquire on Reverb Nation are customers, and how many other musicians? Ninety-nine percent are all other musicians. This sort of weird incestuous situation of people who are never going to buy your music. They hope you're going to buy theirs, but you're not, are you? <laughs> but to make all this stuff work together, what I eventually found is that I use it to drive people here. I've got control here. So I use Facebook, Twitter, Reverb Nation, all the other things to send people here. So when I post a blog update, it appears on my Facebook, which is linked to my Twitter. And suddenly, I was getting two, three thousand visitors a, uh, a month regularly reading my blog. Ask a yeah, of course. Where is there an email subscribe box? Good question. <laughs> You're absolutely right. I'm, I did say at the beginning, I'm still learning, okay? I'm on the foothills for you guys. But it is interesting to find out. I've got RSS, I have got RSS feeds. So you can subscribe to that. But you're right, you're absolutely right. Where's my email subscribe box? Um, the thing is, always like, make some really good feedback websites. It's like having your own website, say what? You've got to sell something on that website, right? Because if you don't, there's no point in sending people there. What's the point in an empty shop window? The other point about websites for me is people think that having a website is the answer to everything. Yeah. It's a passive advertising medium. It requires that somebody either knows you exist or goes looking for you. Yeah. A billboard on the North Circular is an active advertising medium because you know that 30,000 people are going to drive past it every day, out of whom 5% might be interested in your product, out of whom half a percent might actually buy. But it puts it in front of you. Here, yeah, look! Ugh whether you know me or not. A website doesn't do that. And so it's not the answer to everything. It's just one in a set of tools. And you're quite right. You have to keep the content up. Since I stopped doing my Year in the Life of a Musician blog, my hits have gone down. But I'm starting again under mu whoop, Musings of a Muso, <laughs> which will contain random thoughts. I quite often use this in my teaching context as well, if students ask a question or want to know about something, I'll blog about it and post it to them. I have other musicians who follow it because they like hearing me rant, they disagree with me sometimes, they argue with me, but the point is they come and they read it. Yeah? When is the book version of that come from, or the Kindle version of that <laughs> the, the what? The, when is the Kindle version of the yes. book? When I get round to doing it. <laughs> Yes, you're right. A lot of people have said, somebody said to me, I'm not sure if this is kind or not, they said, this would make a great book to have in the loo. <laughs> I'm not quite sure about that. But... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, the subscription model could be expanded to have <clears throat> this kind of thing. You can subscribe. Why, why shouldn't I get you to subscribe to me? There's all sorts of stuff you can do apart from just have a website. And you end up, really, just having to do loads of stuff. Tommy? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. That it makes you... You have to do stuff, even if it's not good. This is the thing that yeah. you know, some artists might not compromise to that. That you need to deliver all the time new stuff. Which might, you get, might get you in a non-creative loop. You know? So that's the only difference. One interesting exercise to do with the subscription model that we don't really have time to do, but is quite fun, is to divide you into two groups, one of whom is the record label and the other whom is, of whom is the artist, and ask you both to prepare for a meeting in which the record label is proposing to the artist that they are going to put all their content onto a subscription delivery platform like Spotify and ask you to prepare your arguments. <laughs> Just think for a minute. If you were the, I mean, to set this, I'll tell you what, let's do it, right. Artists, record label. Come up. The record label, come up. Right there, there. Yeah, Rosie quickly shuffled across. Down the middle here. Come up with two reasons 
on the art, on the record label side, come up with two reasons as to why you think your artist should agree. And artists come up with two reasons. You, I guess you can decide, are you going to agree or are you going to not agree? I'll tell you what, let's give you two minutes to do it in, right? You're the artist, you're the record label. You've got to persuade them, you've got to decide whether or not you're going to be persuaded. You can all talk at once, it will make it more exciting. <laughs> Person from each side, please. <laughs> That'll be you then. Spokesperson from your side? Yeah. That'll be you then. Put your case, your two reasons. Okay. If, if you, Here you are. Okay, if you agree to, um, to put your music um, on Spotify streaming, we can then help you to increase your publicity because good, not any publicity is good publicity. And as an artist, as an artist, you're given okay, you are giving something away free, but you're giving you're given you're increasing knowledge about your music and awareness of your music. So the people that don't know your music will also be able to feed into that and then you can then then we can discuss the next process. Okay. And your response? <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> um, basically, keep it clean, as a, clean. yeah, as a as a band, um, all all the music, all the bands that we grew up on that made us get into music in the first place, we we had vinyl, we had CD, and it was really really important to us to have that. So the reason we're making music is we want to do that for the people that love us. We want we want them to have something physical to hold. And grow up, grow up with. Yes! <laughs> okay, this is not a marriage made in heaven, is it? Okay, good. We have to wrap up. I'd just like to do one more thing to finish. And it's this is the last entry in my year of a musician blog. As you can see, I wander off topic sometimes and write a thing about Maggie Thatcher the day before. <laughs> this is the last one that I wrote. And I'm not saying, I'm not presenting answers, I'm just trying to understand what we have to think about in order to do this. We've got about halfway through the list of business models that I've got in my notes. This could go on forever. But let's get right back to basic concepts of what it is we do. And to me, 
The real question is not what music to listen to or how to find it, but why listen to it at all? Why do our consumers consume our product? That is so fundamental. I'm not asking you why do people come to your gigs. I'm not asking you why do people buy pieces of plastic. I'm not asking you why people download your stuff. I want to know why it is that people consume your product, whatever it is. Because if I know why, I can begin to figure out how to reach them. If I know who they are and why, I can go find them. But if I don't, I'm just firing this stuff out randomly into the darkness. No serious business does that. Andre quite rightly said, you have to think of yourself as a business. You're a cottage industry. I know so many musicians who are cottage industries. Who do really, really very well. Without having the madness of fame. But all of, they, all of them know who their market is. How to reach them. And why they consume their product. Why do people consume your product? If you start with that question you should be able to start to construct some kind of a plan as to how you are going to, here comes another bullshit business speak word, monetize your music. If you come up with a great one, please let me know. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you. That was, that was really fun. I really liked it. That was great. So, I went, while, while we're about to wrap up, I was thinking, what if we had a four-day workshop and then people come and start pitching about the value propositions, pitching. how it's different. <laughs> pitching. <laughs> pitching. <laughs> and what if they start pitching about their values, value propositions, how, and people vote whether it's original, whether it's different. So, maybe that's something to think about for the future yeah, for me. That's good. I think it was a good idea. It, it was a quite creative one. So basically, London Fusion, now you're going to be subscribed to the newsletter as well, also mine, so double spammy. But in November, they run a workshop, a free workshop about business models. So the canvas is the main methodology. And I think it's totally worth it that you come over if you're interested about things like that. So definitely, because Jay mentioned a lot of resources, I'll watch the video again, and I'm going to write down everything that he said, so you can find links, websites, resources, everything else you might need. This is the book he was talking about, the business business model generation. One, two, Woo. business model generation. So I I bought it five days ago. Andre told me about this. Definitely buy it. Seventeen quid from Waterstones. Is it is it all business? Yeah. yeah, it's basically methodology where you structure and you see the relationship of everything you have to offer: revenue, cost, the value proposition, your customers. What? Um, what what's your name again? The orchestra. Laura. Laura. Okay, Laura. So what she did basically, she changed the customers. Right. So normally you have orchestral music and you expect that all people will come over. She changed the the people they're focusing on. That's innovation. This way you can start thinking about how this affects other relationships in what you're trying to build. Anyways, food for thought. We're gonna Sorry, Tommy, there's actually another book by the same author. Yeah. It's called Business Model U. Business Model U. Yeah, that, business may, model you. Yeah, that may be more relevant to kind of the musicians here. Yeah. 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 Right. Sorry to interrupt. And by the way, uh, probably you see my newsletter tomorrow I'm flying to Singapore. Eleven hours. <laughs> And then I'm going to teach a two-day workshop to musicians over there about business models for artists. So basically, after reading this book, I'm adopting everything so it can resonate to musicians. More about this in the future, so keep up with everything we do. I'm going to send you the link about Facebook where you can friend Jay, myself, and everything else. He's an amazing guy. I mean, he can even be a comedian. So anyways, <laughs> thanks a lot for being here. 
more in the future. I think that was the most creative session so far. So an applause for you for being here.